April 12, 1861 was the day the American Civil War went hot. Confederate forces commanded by General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard opened fire on the Federal troops occupying Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. It was an undisputed tactical victory for the South, but that's not why it was so pivotal. Fort Sumter was largely a symbolic military triumph, but the way it unfolded had political and diplomatic repercussions that echoed throughout the war and influence how we view it today. Now, I'm sure the participants would disagree, but I view the Confederate attack on Fort Sumter to be more of an event than a mere battle. Shots were indeed fired, and two men did die, but the consequences of the action were far more momentous than the action itself. When U.S. Army Major Robert Anderson moved his command from the suddenly untenable Fort Moultrie to the more secure Fort Sumter on Christmas night, 1860, he set the stage for a showdown that would ignite the bloodiest war in American history and change the course of the nation forever. From a military standpoint, Anderson's move to Sumter, even though he had no orders to do so, was sound. Moultrie stood at the mouth of Charleston Harbor and was approachable by land and sea. With only 76 men under his command, Anderson could not hope to hold Moultrie against any determined attack by Confederate forces. The nighttime move to Sumter, even though Anderson had only about a tenth of the necessary garrison, provided him with a more defensible post until his situation was hopefully sorted out by higher authorities. Though it was wise militarily, the political ramifications of Anderson's occupation of Sumter soon took center stage. Upon his appointment to the Confederate presidency, Jefferson Davis set about taking control of all United States property in the newly seceded states. Fort Sumter, as it commanded the harbor of the ideological and commercial center of the Confederacy, was high on his list. Anderson's refusal to hand over the fort, however, as he had no orders to do so, put Davis in an awkward position. Only military action in the form of direct attack or blockade could force Anderson from Sumter, as President Buchanan and then President Lincoln had both refused to hand it over to Confederate authorities. Buchanan had sent a ship with provisions for Sumter in January 1861. Southern shore batteries fired on the ship, forcing it to turn back. By the time Lincoln took office in March, Anderson was running low on food and was near the end of his ability to hold out. Lincoln was now the man on the spot. He had the choice of handing over the fort outright, sending a fleet to resupply and reinforce Anderson, or do nothing and allow the fort to surrender. From the standpoint of Lincoln's stated goal of preserving the Union, the first option was no option at all. Any voluntary surrender of the fort on the part of the U.S. government would be, in effect, recognition of the legitimacy of the Confederacy's claim to be an independent nation. Since Lincoln steadfastly maintained that secession was illegal, he could not take any action to contradict that position. As a conscientious commander-in-chief, Lincoln also could not abandon Anderson and his men. Such an action would also have the effect of showing weakness in a volatile political environment and have the dual prospect of emboldening Southern leaders and possibly losing the support of his own party. In the end, against the advice of much of his cabinet, including Secretary of State William Seward, Lincoln seized on a plan put forth by Secretary of the Navy Gustavus Fox. Fox planned to send a fleet to Charleston with the express purpose of resupplying Sumter. If there was no resistance by the Confederates, Sumter would only receive food and supplies. If the fleet were fired upon, it would shoot its way into the harbor with supplies and reinforcements for the garrison. The muscle for the fleet was to come from the U.S. Navy steamer Powhatan. Through a bit of subterfuge on the part of Seward, the Powhatan was ultimately unavailable for the expedition. Seward thought that it was a bad idea. He made sure the Powhatan wasn't there. Lincoln sent the fleet anyway, making sure to inform South Carolina Gov Governor Francis Pickens of his intent to only resupply, not reinforce Sumter, thus maintaining the status quo in Charleston Harbor. In keeping with his earlier practice of non-recognition of the Confederate government, Lincoln communicated directly with Pickens as opposed to Davis, thus maintaining his position that South Carolina was still part of the United States. But Davis was quickly brought into the loop by Pickens, and the authorization for the attack ultimately came from the Confederate capital at Montgomery, Alabama. On April 11th, the Confederate commander at Charleston, Beauregard, demanded Anderson surrender. Anderson refused, saying he had no orders to leave his post. Anderson did add that if the Confederates were willing to forestall any attack, his command would be forced to abandon Sumter within a few days due to lack of provisions. 
Davis, when he was notified of Anderson's statement, ordered that Anderson provide a specific date for the fort's abandonment. By the time the Confederate emissaries rode back out to the fort to request this information, it was the early morning of April 12th. Anderson gave his date of departure as April 15th. Knowing that the U.S. supply fleet would arrive before then, Confederate Colonel James Chestnut, the ranking Southerner president, rejected Anderson's proposal and informed him that Beauregard would open fire on the fort in one hour's time. Anderson escorted Chestnut to his boat and shaking Chestnut's hand he said, chokingly, if we never meet again in this world, God grant that we may meet in the next. At 4.30 a.m. on April 12, 1861, the first shots of the American Civil War were fired from Charleston at Fort Sumter. Anderson began to return sporadic fire, because he was low on ammunition, at 7.30. The Union Supply Fleet arrived off Charleston Harbor during the day, but without the firepower, the Powhatan could not send any help to the fort. The fleet eventually turned and headed home. After 34 hours of bombardment, Anderson surrendered his command. Amazingly, no one had been killed on either side. The first casualty of the war, Union Private Daniel Ho, was killed as a result of an explosion during Anderson's salute to the U.S. flag upon handing over the fort to Beauregard. One other Union soldier was mortally wounded in the blast. The beast must be fed, after all. Anderson's resistance satisfied the necessity of not giving up Sumter voluntarily and allowed Lincoln to maintain his position of the southern states as being in a state of rebellion as opposed to having created a new sovereign nation. From a legal and diplomatic standpoint, this distinction was important in terms of how the Union would prosecute the war and deal with potential foreign intervention. Had Lincoln not been able to hold on to the pretense of legality, any possible recognition of the Confederate government by the powers of Europe would have been much easier. As it was, Lincoln was able to stave off any such intervention, as well as define the nature of the war as an internal matter as opposed to a revolution, which was the position taken by the Confederacy. The argument over the legality of secession continues today, though it's generally accepted that the question was settled by the outcome of the war. If so, it's because Abraham Lincoln was shrewd enough to frame the diplomatic and legal questions his way from the beginning. Had he appeared to give the Confederacy legitimate legal standing, he would have implicitly recognized the legality of secession. Though Lincoln had tried his best to maintain peace, he had been forced into war. Once the southern guns had fired upon Sumter, his options were gone. The Confederate victory in Charleston galvanized the nation. Southerners flocked to join the ranks to repel the invasion they knew was coming once Lincoln issued a call for troops to suppress the rebellion. In the north, states answered the call for volunteers with enthusiasm, eventually enlisting far more than their original quotas. Upon Lincoln's call for troops, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee seceded and were welcomed into the Confederacy. The border states of Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri hung in the balance. There was jubilation across the South, but there were some who were not so confident of the path taken. A Virginia woman who lived across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. wrote ominously, I heard distinctly the drums beating in Washington. And then, probably echoing the thoughts of many, she wrote, As I looked at the Capitol in the distance, I could scarcely believe my senses that capital of which I had always been so proud. Can it be possible that it is no longer our capital? Must this union, which I was taught to revere, be rent asunder? As Lincoln said, the war came. It would not end until over 700,000 Americans were dead and the national psyche changed forever. As always, thank you for watching. My sources are listed below. If you liked what you saw, please give us a like and a subscribe. Maybe check us out, check out some of our cool merchandise, and check out our blog at militaryhistorychronicle.com.